thank you everybody for joining us uh, to our webinar. And uh, of course, uh, as we said before, following the success of the Netflix movie, My Octopus Teacher, we're hosting today two main experts on octopus and neuro neurobiology. Benny Hochner studied neurobiology at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem and did his postdoctoral training with Professor Eric Kandel, Nobel laureate for medicine in 2000 at the Columbia University. Currently, he is a professor of neurobiology at our department of neurobiology. Letizia Zullo graduated in biological sciences in 2001 at the Federico II University in Naples, Italy. She received then her PhD in applied biology in 2004 uh, on the organization of the higher motor centers in Octopus vulgaris. Currently, she is a researcher at the Center of Microbiorobotics uh, and Department of Neuroscience and Brain Technology at, at the Istituto Italiano di Tecnologia. And uh, as usual, before we begin, I would also like to remind you that we will open the question and answer session at the end of our lectures. And you are welcome to ask your question in the chat or by raising your digital hand. So now, please, uh, the floor is yours. Good evening, everybody. Me and Letizia are going to discuss this amazing animal, the octopus. We are working on octopus vulgaris. And what you are seeing here, and uh, uh, you see an octopus looking with his camera like eye between his arms. And I think the best way, Lara already uh, <laughs> stole my surprise, is to. And then I think the best thing will be to see the movie or the, actually the trailer of the movie, The Octopus, my teacher Octopus, that was, uh, that really did a, 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 a big impact and may, and put the octopuses on the, on, 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 on the, on the popular agenda. Uh, Till now, only us knew how fascinating this animal is. So I, I show this. I remember the day when it all started, seeing this really strange thing. Is it OK? A lot of people say that an octopus is like an alien. But the strange thing is, as you get closer to them, you realize that you're very similar in a lot of ways. It's a hard thing to explain, but sometimes you just get a feeling and you know there's something to this creature that's very unusual. There's something to learn here. I had to have a radical change in my life. And the only way I knew to do it was to be in the ocean with her. And then I had this crazy idea. What happens if I just went every day? I realized that there's a line that can't be crossed. your own vulnerability, worried about your family or child. I hadn't been a person that was overly sentimental towards animals before. I realized I was changing. My relationship with people, with humans, was changing. What she taught me was to feel that you part of this place, not a visitor. That's a huge difference. Okay, so I'll give you a, a short introduction to what the octopus are, a biological background. So the octopus, it belongs to the molluscan uh, phylum. And uh, I think the uh, molluscan film is an uh, extraordinary example to the huge 
evolution that the, can occur at the same film. So on one hand, we have a, a very simple creature like, like uh, the clam. And on the other hand, we have this huge uh, development of the octopus, which has a huge brain, like of uh, half a billion uh, ner uh, neurons in his ne uh, nerve cell, while the clam has probably 5,000 or something like that. And with a huge behavior, it's a predator. It, uh, it has a wonderful uh, 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 vision. And uh, uh, the octopus belongs to the cephalopod, as I said. And in the, in the cephalopod, it's also a very interesting group. There is a modern cephalopod that uh, most of you know that this is the octopus uh, vulgaris here. And you have the sepia officinalis, the cuttlefish, and you have the, the squid, the loligo. And uh, the, the old cephalopod, the, the only uh, living uh, fossil today, is actually the nautilus. They didn't change for many, many millions of years. And actually, comparison between the two, you, you can get an uh, impression how big the evolution of this uh, 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 group of modern cephalopod that undergone. Now, the, we are studying the octopus from two aspects. One is the, as an example to motor control in a soft bodied animal. And this will be uh, uh, mainly the subject of uh, Letizia in her talk. And uh, I, I will be interested in, in what makes this animal uh, cognitive behavior of this animal, the neurophysiological basis that of uh, this highly evolved animal. So uh, first I'll, I'll give you a tour of what are the part of the animal. This animal, you start with the, the, the structure of the animal is very unusual. You cannot say this is the uh, head and this is the nose and this is the arm. It is a very strange alien kind of uh, morphology. And what else, what we will, try to convince you not so much in this cell, uh, what we are trying to understand in, the, in, the, in, the, in our studies is what the animal uh, has achieved by uh, evolving such a, uh, um, a strange morphology that helps it into in its uh, motor behavior. And part of it will raise in uh, Letizia uh, talk. So here you see the eye, this is a camera-like eye, as I said. We have a very good sight. The brain is the central brain is situated be between between the two eyes. This is the head. This is not the nose of the arm. This is the mental, which uh, uh, enclose the internal uh, organs of the animal, and also it's a it's a muscular structure that pushes in and out water for breathing and for swimming through the siphon eight arms that emerging directly from the, from the head. From, from here comes the name uh, cephalopod. Actually, pod, it's a leg that comes right from the head and it's around the head in a symmetrical way. The mouth is at the center of the arms. Here you see the suckers. There is a web that is very helpful for the octopus for, in, his, uh, in his hunting. Uh, uh, behavior. This is a predator, as I said. So this is the front and this is the back of the animal. And in this case, you see that the oct octopus stand on, the, on his four hind leg and send, and uh, reaches with his, with his form, uh, 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 front arm uh, uh, forward. So the octopus reaches this kind of sophistication by two evolutionary uh, process. One, in one process, the octopus developed a unique mechanism that is, uh, that is unique to this uh, group of animals or even to the octopus itself because there is a difference between different group of cephalopods. So uh, as I said already, the octopus has uh, evolved a very unusual body morphology, which is important for performing its uh, task, as we will show. There is a unique, in no other animal, this kind of uh, mechanism exists 
And this is a, a way to change the color of the skin by normally control the mechanism. This can occur very fast. It's not like in, uh, in chameleon where the hormone uh, modulate the color of the animal. It can occur in a millisecond uh, time. And uh, this is not that important. So we'll start with this kind of um, uh, uh, changes. Uh, so for example, the first thing is developing, a, a, as I said, a, a very unique morphology and finding the way to control it, to control this morphology. So, uh, uh, so here what we see is how the octopus reached to a target by extending arm in a very stereotypical uh, movement. And Letizia will talk about it more in her talk. So this is some way to solve the problem of controlling arm that doesn't have any skeletal element and it's completely flexible and can move in any direction. The other one is uh, the, uh, the, the very amazing mechanism of uh, camouflage of this animal. Have. This is the Roger Hellon movie and this is algae. You have to put uh, your attention and you see suddenly the octopus appears. You got a very, now you can see that it's swim. You see also that the squid can spit uh, ink to disguise himself also. Now you will see this movie in a, a slow motion reverse direction. And you see how the animal by changing the color of the skin and the texture of the, of the skin is assimilate itself into the algae as if you cannot and you will not be able to uh, to uh, distinguish between the alga, alga and algae and the and the octopus. Now this uh, this mechanism I, I will not talk about it. Just show you this beautiful how the skin of the octopus looks through the microscope and these small tiny cells are chromatophore cells that can change their color. There is about five type of color that uh, can, uh, uh, by different activation of this, uh, like in our uh, uh, television screen, can change the overall color of the animal and can, and can produce such a dynamical uh, uh, change in the camouflage of the animal. Now the systems that evolved, other system has evolved synergistic, synergist convergently with those in, uh, for example, in vertebra, vertebrates. So for example, the camera like eyes, a vestibular systems that uh, help the animal to measure the gravi gravitational forces, the central, uh, cent very highly centralized brain and a very fast learning and long-term memory that I will dwell a little bit in, in my talk uh, today about this me the mechanism. So the eye is a really amazing situation because this is probably the best, first, uh, the, the best example for, to what is called convergent evolution. You see that we separated from the octopus very, very early in, uh, in evolution, about uh, 75 million uh, years ago. And the camera eyes of our camera eye appeared at this time in history. And in the, in, in the octopus about this time. So they have, they, they evolve completely independently and still they have the same physical structure with, with, uh, uh, with um, uh, lens, with the pupil, with the cornea, with the retina, nerves that lead, uh, leading to the brain. Uh, so this, the, the physical structure that uh, that um, uh, focus the light into the into the retina are exactly the same in the two in the two system, but it's important to uh, know that the mechanism by which the light is uh, is transformed transformed into uh, electrical signal in the nervous system is completely different. Octopus still maintain invertebrate mechanism, which is completely different from that of, of uh, vertebrate. 
So now we go to the, uh, cent to the nervous system of uh, the octopus, which control this sophisticated uh, behavior. Now, the nervous system is huge, as I said, but it's something very special about the organization of this uh, system that is also organized in different way in, than in other animal. So for example, here we see that uh, it can be studied, the nervous system can be, distribute, be distributed into three parts. The, the part which is the peripheral nervous system is where uh, all the nervous system are located in the arm itself. And this number of nerve cells that are in, uh, concentrated in the arm themselves, it's, it's about two thirds of the, uh, of the half a billion neurons of the octopus. In the central nervous system, we see, and uh, Letitia will tell you, uh, will tell you how this uh, huge amount of nerve cell in the arm, how they control the uh, performance of the arm itself at the level of the periphery. In the central nervous system, we have the central brain where all the ex executive uh, function take place, including learning memories that we will take, uh, we'll take about, we'll, we'll talk about. And here you see two huge uh, optical lobes that process the information that comes from the eyes. So the brain actually gets a very highly processed visual information from the eyes. So we are interested in, two, in a, a special area in the, in the, in the octopus brain. The octopus, octopus brain uh, at the dorsal part of the brain, there are two areas that are controlling visual learning and tactile learning. Tactile learning, the octopus can learn to associate between um, different input, a sensory input, to the arm and, and reward or, or punishment. Here, the visual uh, learning system is associating a visual signal that the octopus sees and associate them with, again, with reward or uh, punishment. Here is the view from uh, above. Now, if uh, we take a uh, sagittal slice of, an, of the octopus, we see that the octopus is still organized like, uh, like the nervous system of, uh, of other invertebrates. It's composed of unique separated ganglia or lobes. So here, what is circled by, by red is a system of the vertical lobe that control visual learning. Here we have the system separated from, from this. It, this is controlled the tactile learning. And the area below these two uh, learning and memory uh, centers is the higher motor control center that Letizia will tell you about how, uh, how it's organized. So, uh, so the vertical lobe actually is organized like many uh, networks that are dealing with association uh, uh, sensory information. There are uh, infra, uh, sensory information coming into the vertical lobe, here you have huge amount of small amacrine thread, 25 million cells that are uh, integrating the information, the visual information that comes from the sensory input via the MSF uh, axon as it goes and innovate ampersand, the many amacrine uh, cell. This amacrine cell then converge on very few or uh, relatively few large neuron. This neuron leaves the, uh, uh, the vertical lobe and their output control the behavior circuit. And what we see is that the main function of the vertical lobe is actually to inhibit this behavioral uh, controlling circuit. It is be this, this uh, behavior circuit uh, uh, inhibit the uh, natural tendency of the animal to, to attack everything that moves in front, in front of the animal. It's organized like a, a artificial classification network, in fan out, fan in, but this is not very important for us. What is important for us today is to show you that in the octopus a vertical lobe, when we study the physiological properties in this structure, 
we, we reveal that similar cellular properties in the octopus uh, vertical lobe as exist in the hippocampus, in our hippocampus, which is an area that is uh, like the vertical lobe in the octopus is responsible uh, for uh, learning and memory in, uh, in vertebrate. So in both cases, what we can see that if we stimulate the input to uh, the vertical lobe with a strong stimulation, high frequency stimulation, the synaptic connection, the connection between the incoming and the outgoing neuron is getting stronger. And this is what is called potentiation. It's a strengthening of the synapse. So here you see a record of the, this phenomena you have in the control, this is in the black. And when you have to, you give a very high stimulation here, there is a very, there is high, high facilitation of this field, uh, synaptic field potential, and it's really got much, much bigger. Now it's not that it's only got bigger, but it stays for a very long time. Actually, it stays for, for can stay for 10, 10 long hours. And similar phenomena of, is occurring with sem, similar uh, expression, physiological expression occurs in our, or uh, not in our, but in, in a, in a, in a mouse, uh, the, let's say uh, preparations that you do this kind of this kind of uh, uh, experiment. So this this physiological phenomena is highly associated with mechanism where experience in in our nerve stem is translated into a change in the physiological properties, meaning the connection between nerve cells. And these long-term changes in connection between nerve cells, this is actually what registrate our memories. So, uh, so what I uh, show you now, showed you now, is that the two phenomena are really very similar to each other in both animals. So there is convergent evolution to similar solution of changing the strengths of synaptic connection during, uh, during le learning. But if we look at the detail of the process, we see that there are, big, that there are difference. So it's not that important, but for example, for in the octopus, the expression of, uh, the, uh, of uh, facilitation is presynaptic and the NMDA receptor, which is a very unique molecule in vertebrate for mediating this long-term changes in synaptic, uh, uh, synaptic connection doesn't have a rule in this LTP. In the octopus, what has evolved is adaptation of a specific neuromodulatory system, which is a nitric oxide system. The nitric oxide system is very common mechanism for, uh, for plasticity in, in vertebrate. It's also a uh, function in, in our body, but mainly for modulation of uh, the muscle in our uh, vascular system to control the uh, blood pressure and uh, so, but in here, it was adapted to mediate this long-term potentiation. And I will show you this uh, 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 briefly. Before that, I would like to show you an, an, uh, 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 that it's not only uh, that the activity can change the connection between, between the, uh, the nerve cell in the, in the vertical uh, lobe of the octopus, but also as in our uh, nervous system, neuromodulators. And here serotonin is a very important mediator because it facilitates the, uh, the induction of LTP. So if you uh, apply here 5-HT uh, uh, serotonin, you see that there is a very in, uh, big increase in the synaptic connection and the uh, tetanization that doesn't induce any more facilitation. So actually, 5-HT by itself with the activity can induce LTP. So what we can see uh, says that serotonin reinforces uh, uh, the LTP induction. So uh, here I'll give you some, uh, 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 before I give you the model, I will show you 
uh, the behavior of the octopus that we are studying in the behavior study. So what we are training the octopus is to refrain from attacking this red ball because every time he touches this red ball, he gets small electric shock. So you see that after the, se the, the cell trial already, the octopus is very cautious in attacking the red ball, in the stereotypical attacking of the red ball. And now you see tests. This is the day after, 20 uh, memory, long-term memory. You see that after the first, he attacked this one, but now he reminds that this is not a good uh, uh, idea to attack this red ball because yesterday I got some uh, electric shock out of it. Now, if you put a white ball that was not associated with the punishment coming soon, you will see that the octopus is attacking the white ball as usual. So it means the octopus associated the red ball with the punishment, and therefore it was refraining from attacking it. So here I, I try to give you a very, in very short detail, some idea how this happens. So the octopus actually has to associate between the color of the ball and the shape of the ball. And what you see, uh, this, the shape and the color of the ball are associated in the vertical lobe, they are coming to the vertical lobe, they are also activating in parallel the attack behavior. Now, now, now if during this associ association between the shape and the, and the color of the ball, the octopus get punishment, probably it releases 5-HT serotonin into this area and this facilitate the induction of LTP and creating the association between uh, uh, this, this red ball and the punishment that led the, the octopus later on to release some inhibitory transmitter from these large neurons that inhibit this uh, attack behavior uh, circuitry. Now in the octopus, I told you that, uh, I think I'm okay, that the, uh, the mechanism of LTP is different than uh, in, uh, in, in, in the NFDA dependent LTP in the hippocampus. And in the, in, and in the octopus, a very interesting adaptation of, an, of the NO system uh, has occurred. And what you can see here, First of all, there is a, uh, here there is a histochemical labeling of the enzyme, the activity of the enzyme that produce, produce NO. And you can see that it's very concentrated, concentrated in the neuropil of the uh, learning and memory area. This is the learn, tactile learning area, and this is the visual learning area. So in both cases, the, the, there is a presence of this enzyme that the, uh, nitric oxide the synthase, which produce NO. So after giving LTP and the uh, synapse is strengthening, if you put a drug that block, uh, block the enzyme from producing NO, you see that this, this uh, strengthening is disappearing. And now when you wash the drug out, it's coming back. So in this, uh, in this uh, case, uh, special molecular switch has evolved that where uh, NO is controlling the persistent activation of the enzymes that produce itself. And in this way, a positive feedback is created, which produce constantly NO that cause this, uh, that maintain this LTP for a very long time. So this is a unique mechanism that has evolved in the octopus to solve this uh, cellular process of long-term potentiation. And this is the model. And uh, uh, it's only to say that, uh, uh, okay, I'll, 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 I'll skip this. And I just uh, summarize that the molluscal nitric oxide uh, system is conserved in the octopus wheel, uh, vertical lobe. So the mechanism of involvement in ad is adapted to mediate LTP expression and long-term maintenance. 
so it, and then the final conclusion is that while universal cellular mechanism of learning and memory, uh, LTP, is conver convergently evolved in octopus and human, the biochemical processes that mediate octopus LTP, uh, the molecular switch, has, has evolved independently of each other. And this is uh, the end of my part. And now I'll, uh, we will move to uh, Letizia. I, I'll stop sharing. Okay, can you see my presentation? Just open it, yeah. Yes, we can see Letizia, thank okay. you. Okay, so hi to everybody and uh, thanks for inviting me. And uh, uh, I will continue with the, uh, uh, after Dennis talk uh, on the on the octopus brain and uh, in particular what I want to, to tell you it's uh, how the brain it's not only intelligent and have uh, remarkable abilities uh, memory abilities but it is also very complex in terms of uh, uh, movement control. So first of all, uh, it is important to, um, to think that the octopus uh, arm, the octopus limb are not as uh, uh, typical vertebrates limb. They are named the muscle hydrostats and we do have in nature several examples of uh, uh, muscle hydrostats like the elephant trunk or our tongue. And muscle hydrostats are a very specific structure that are not constrained to any rigid uh, uh, exoskeleton or endoskeleton. So they are completely uh, flexible. Yeah, uh, sorry, um, can you speak a bit closer to your microphone? Yes, it's better now? Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so I was saying that the, uh, the limb the, of the octopus of uh, octopus and other cephalopods are muscle hydrostats, which have few main characteristics that uh, uh, are common to many other type of muscle hydrostats. So first of all, this structure have a constant volume. Uh, that means that any change in one direction, it's accompany accompanied by an opposite change in uh, another direction. And uh, this is possible uh, because they have a very complex architecture of muscle and connective tissue and there is a special arrangement of antagonistic muscles working in any of these uh, structure. So all of these structure that you see are very flexible, uh, but uh, flexibility you know, is not the only thing. So in this video, I would like you to get the feeling of what uh, an octopus is able to do with this uh, flexible arm. And as you can see, there is a, a large repertoire of movement and even a posture that he can uh, acquire in a, uh, in a natural environment. And here in particular, you can see two uh, nice, uh, nice um, video uh, recordings where the octopus does something very special. So it does not only use its uh, arm uh, as they uh, were completely flexible structure, but he can also generate what are called uh, articulated structure uh, by stiffening part of the entire limb. And this is extremely important because allow the animal not only to be very flexible, but also to acquire rigidity when it needs to. So on the basis of the behavioral tasks that the task that he will perform. And this is especially evident in the video that Benny showed you uh, just uh, before, uh, this is a reaching task. This is an animal in the lab. So it's, an, let's say, an artificial environment. And uh, uh, the animal does this uh, um, motion very often. It's the typical uh, reaching uh, behavior that he does when he wants to reach an object, usually an interesting object or a piece of food. And the very interesting thing is that this motion, it's not done uh, in, uh, in any kind of uh, uh, 
uh, of kinematics using any kinematics, but it's done using a very specific kinematics, which you, you can see down here. That is a bell-shaped, uh, a bell-shaped velocity profile, and this is similar to what uh, happens also in the human reaching. So, although we have articulated structure, we use in terms of kinematics exactly the same, uh, the same mechanism that it's uh, represented in the octopus uh, reaching movement. Uh, and another very nice motion that uh, you can. Uh, uh, where you can see this, uh, uh, the formation of, of, uh, of these uh, articulated limbs is the octopus uh, uh, fetching. So the fe fetching is the motion that the animal uses to bring an object uh, to the mouth. And uh, again, he in theory could use any strategy to do that, uh, but instead it doesn't do, it doesn't go, let's say random, but he use a very specific strategy, which is to generate, to reconfigure its arm in a semi-articulated structure, just uh, configuring uh, like a shoulder and a nail bow and uh, making a semi-articulated structure as we uh, vertebrate do. And this is possible due, due to the possibility of the, of the octopus to stiffen a small segment of its, uh, uh, of its limb. And uh, as you can see here, this is uh, not only generating the stiffness again randomly, but it's generating stiffness in specific location of the arm. And uh, by doing that, he is sure he allows this, uh, his arm to bring very efficiently the piece of uh, food directly into the mouth. So, uh, how it is possible to control this kind of motion in vertebrates and how the octopus does it. So in vertebrates, we have what is uh, called homunculus uh, uh, somatoaestheticus. And this homunculus it's that you can see represented here, it's, uh, um, it's an homunculus that is represented both in the motor and in the sensory area. And you can see here that each body part is represented in a specific cortical motor or sensory area. And the area that, the, uh, that, the, um, that uh, one of the limb or one of the body uh, or one of our body uh, occupies, it's uh, uh, relevant is very relevant to the use of that uh, uh, of that limb of that structure. So you can see that the, that our tongue here down in the right corner, it's occupying comparatively speaking a very large portion of the cortical uh, sensory areas. So uh, when we first approached this, uh, this problem, we asked what was the situation for the octopus? Because you, you can easily imagine that representing a, a, an arm that has infinite degrees of freedom and that, and that is not restrained to any uh, rigid structure, it's, uh, uh, quite, uh, it's quite hard. So what we did, was to try to see if something like this, so the, let's say the sensory homunculus and the motor homunculus was true and was uh, conserved even in uh, octopuses. So the question that we asked basically is, is there an octopunculus? Is there a structure that can be something similar to the, to, uh, the vertebrate model? So in order to exploit this, we, uh, started with an investigation on the central, uh, central areas of the octopus brain that are in charge of the control of the motor and sensory action, in particular of the arm. And we know, as Benny showed you before, that this area is here, uh, it's circled in, uh, in red, and it's, uh, uh, this area comprised uh, the area of uh, the higher uh, sensory motor centers at least for what it, is, uh, uh, what it is known so far from uh, uh, literature. So we addressed uh, in particular this area and we performed a series of experiment uh, um, performing uh, um, electrical recording in free living animals, in freely behaving animals from 
all these uh, uh, these uh, higher uh, motor centers area. And what we found here, what you can see is that indeed we could record the sensory activity due to the tactile stimulation of arm or on a uh, mantle or on the dorsal surface of the uh, of the um, um, uh, of the head of the animal in various parts of the uh, of the octopus brain. So it seems that there is not a somatosensory representation of the octopus brain, as you could record activity from both arm and mantle, basically in any location you were recording. And uh, uh, on top of this, what, it, what we found very surprising is that indeed you can even record different type of activity. So not only different activity from different uh, body parts, but even activity uh, belonging to different sensory modalities. As you can see here, you can record visual response uh, while we were flashing lights on the octopus uh, eyes. Uh, and you can record this activity in the exact same location where you could record also sensory activity. So this was uh, in a way difficult to, uh, to, to explain uh, but indeed, when we went back to the old uh, study, histological study on J.Z. Young, we found that indeed this was exactly how it should be, because this area, that our area uh, of uh, uh, controlling the higher motor centers are highly integrative area. And it is described that a large number of fibers running from statuses, running from the visual system, do converge in many points of the higher motor centers. So here you can see the full repertoire of uh, um, the full repertoire of uh, uh, areas that we recorded and of type of modalities or sensory modalities that we tested. So uh, what we wanted to do at this point was to uh, try to see if in this complex activity that you can see here, because it's not single spike, it's a bursting activity, which is collectively recording from many uh, different neurons. So we wanted to see if by characterizing these uh, spikes, we could indeed see a difference in the neuron uh, that was firing. And we did so uh, by doing a cluster analysis on spike recognition. And indeed, we found that we could record the, the, the same cluster here. Each cluster is belonging to a certain modalities, meaning, for example, that the yellow one is one uh, cluster of neurons, the red is one cluster of neurons. And here you can see the different activity that we tested. So as you can see, most of the cluster are shared between the different modalities. But indeed, there are some clusters that pop out that pop out only during specific stimulation. So that means that we do not, that we do have a multi-unit activity at single areas of the octopus brain, and that uh, many uh, modalities can be recorded, uh, can converge in single areas, but indeed some of these modalities, so some of these response possibly comes from neurons that, has, that specifically responds to either sensory or either uh, visual uh, input. So we are still, uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, study is still ongoing, but we uh, are starting to understand, we started to understand that actually in the octopus brain, there's no uh, octopunculus, at least in the sensory representation. Uh, but the, the representation is more sparse. So what we did next was to uh, stimulate the same area that we were recording from and to analyze the behavioral repertoire that we could uh, elicit. And again, here is uh, an example of, of a few of the main uh, behavior that we observed. As you can see here, we observe the very complex motion like arm extension, crawling, uh, inkjet, which is a very complex motion, uh, and also very discrete response, which means only small changes of color of the animal or very restricted uh, movement. 
So what we found here is that again, if you look at this, uh, this uh, map, uh, you cannot really, uh, uh, you cannot make evidence of any area where you can specifically elicit one of these behavior, but this behavior can be elicited in many parts of the higher motor centers. So again, this was, a, a, this was a, um, an insight into the absence of a, a, not only a sensory, but also a motor somatotopic organization. And uh, even more, if you, can, if you look here at the threshold of stimulation that we used, what you can appreciate is that indeed the, the, these that are all complex motion were recruited gradually. So that means that enlarging the area of stimulation, you could recruit in the form of kind of overlapping circuits, all the small, uh, the small parts that compose a complex motion. So this is a, a, very, a very important difference between vertebrates and uh, octopus. And we don't know if it's a general to cephalopods, but let's say octopus, higher motor centers organization. So it seems the world, what it has been always defined as a higher motor centers in the octopus works much more like a, a high integrative center. So uh, next, what I wanted to, uh, to tell you is that everything about the, uh, the higher motor centers, it has to deal in any case with a very sophisticated peripheral nervous system. As Benny told you before, we are now dealing with one third of uh, neuronal cells in the center, in the central brain of the animal, but we have other two thirds of uh, uh, neurons that are not at all in the central nervous system, but are in the periphery. And these two third of neurons can do a lot of things. So in this video, you can see an octopus that of course was trained to do so, otherwise he would have taken, taken us an, uh, an entire day to see this motion. So this octopus is uh, uh, closed into this jar and it's uh, able to, uh, to get off the cap of this jar and to be released. Now, if you see, given the position of the octopus eyes, he, he is uh, actually is not allowed to see the cap. So this entire motion has to be done without the use of the eyes. So it's not a visually guided motion and it's not actually an easy, an easy task for an octopus. So what this, uh, uh, this video tells you is that although the central nervous system is very complex and it can control very complex motion, indeed there is a large part of the control that must be, that must rely at the level of the peripheral nervous system. And this uh, gets to the very big question that, po that pop popped out lately. So do we have arm brains? So do we have a huge centralized brain, but on top of this, we have arm brains that control the motion of each arm and that can also teach, let's say, so that are also memory center for the arm. So in order to understand this point, a uh, uh, few very nice uh, experiments, behavioral experiments have been done recently uh, by the group of, uh, of Benny actually. And uh, I will present you three of these, uh, of these main experiments. So in this first experiment, you can see here an octopus that was trained to put his arm into this um, uh, two arm uh, maze. This is a vertical maze. And only on one side of the arm, there is a rough stimulus. So the octopus could not see it because the maze was completely opaque, but could just feel the uh, rough stimulus only on one side of the maze. So there was a foot on both sides, on both sides of this gold box, but only on one side, the animal that was the one connected to the rough stimulus the animal was indeed able to retrieve the food. On the other side, there was a, remover, a removable net, which would not allow the animal 
to get the food out. So uh, what it was done here was to train the animal to reach the food on the side where it was the rough stimulus, and it was tested its learning ability. So the first very nice uh, evidence that they had is that also opposite to what had been, uh, let's say, our literature heritage, we, uh, they demonstrated that indeed the octopus is able to associate a, a tactile stimulus of this kind with a food reward. But even more importantly, what this experiment uh, uh, told us is that the learning that, the, that occurs in the octopus is not a learning that is connected to, uh, to the arm, so it's not a specific, to a, a, a specific arm, but it's centralized. And why is that? Because the arm, as you can see here, uh, uh, the arm, the, the octopus could insert more than one arm into the maze, but independently on the arm that he was putting into the maze, at the end of the uh, of the test, he would still be able to learn the uh, to learn the task. That means that even if he would put an arm that had never experienced this uh, uh, this uh, rough stimulus, it would still be able to direct it, to direct its arm correctly. And this is the first evidence, at least that I am aware, of uh, let's say a proof of a central and integrated system of uh, learning in an octopus. In the second experiment, I want to show you. Uh, what we uh, tested was the possibility that the octopus could also learn on the basis of proprioception, which means that here you do not have any uh, rough stimulus, you do not have any tactile stimulation, but the octopus has to learn only to insert its arm in the correct uh, uh, goal box on the basis of its localization, either on the right or on the left. And this is something for an animal, for an eight arm animal, very complex indeed. Uh, and uh, we show that the animal is able to do so. And again, this is this kind of learning. It's not a learning that it's connected to, to this to this specific arm that it's uh, that the octopus is using in its uh, training test. So in conclusion, the octopus can learn either Via, can, via tactile stimulation and via, um, via let's say, proprioceptive information, but this, is, this learning occurs centrally. So there's no, no kind of uh, octopus uh, arm brains which is mediating this type of learning. And last, uh, this is also a, a very nice experiment where the octopus was trained to associate a visual stimulus, which you can see here in C as a blue spot, with the presence of food. In this case, the octopus could not feel the chemical uh, coming from the words because he had to put its arm outside water and then inside the maze. But this was the first evidence that the octopus can indeed use a visual stimulation to locate and to direct its arm um, into the chemical, uh, to the chemical section. This is even more interesting because getting back to the representation that we showed, that we found in the octopus brain, it means that what we found that there is not, that there is not a separation, actually that there is a high convergence of sensory and visual modality in the octopus, high motor center, it really makes much sense for an octopus. Okay, so in conclusion, the octopus um, needs the brain to learn, uh, to learn its way. Uh, and this is uh, uh, actually, a, I would say, a milestone into, the, uh, into, the, our, into our knowledge of uh, octopus uh, uh, learning so far. Okay, so now uh, I want just briefly to show you uh, what we can do about it. So this is all nice and all beautiful in terms of biology, but what we can do, what, how we can use all this information. So as uh, uh, you might know, we have been also involved in many um, 
in many projects uh, uh, related to robotics and to soft robotics. And the first thing that, of course, roboticists ask you as a biologist, okay, this is very nice, but it's too complicated. So how, how can we reduce this level of complexity? And uh, when we first uh, uh, approach this, uh, this problem, here you see many of the prototypes that have been built in the last 10 to 15, uh, to 15 years. Uh, and uh, as you can see, actually here, you have many examples of soft, uh, soft prototype and soft, uh, oops, sorry, and soft arms. And when we first uh, were involved in one of these uh, projects, in the Octopus project, we uh, thought about uh, um, dealing with this problem from another perspective. So we uh, thought about starting to thinking that the octopus is, uh, uh, is able to solve this problem by using a, a slightly different strategy. So that it's uh, what we call morphological intelligence and this is what Benny is very fan of, which is the concept of embodiment. So here you can see an example, a very, uh, let's say basic example of what is an embodied morphological intelligence. This is, uh, one of the, let's say, simplest form of uh, robots that you can build is called the passive work, uh, worker. It has been developed by the MIT. And as you can see, this is uh, just a passive worker. So there's no feedback control. There's no feed forward control. There's actually no control at all. And that's also the reason why it's falling at the end of the video. But it tells you something very interesting so that you can try to exploit the morphology of your system, being this a biological system or an artificial system to reduce, uh, to highly reduce the complexity of uh, motion control. So we started from this principle and we analyzed the, uh, we started analyzing the structure and the, uh, the constitution of the octopus arm. So what are the elements that you can look for and that you can investigate in order to reduce uh, the, uh, the, the control problem of a muscular structure? So here you can see an example of how a vertebrate uh, muscle is moving and how a, a muscle, let's say in general, the, the, the a musculator of a soft body is, um, is uh, moving. And you can immediately see that here they are, are uh, locating the, uh, let's say, the increase in length of the muscle. So while a vertebrate muscle is restrained to tendon and bones, an hydrostatic muscle is not restrained to anything. That means that one thing that is different is the possibility of changing the length. So for sure, length is something that it's different and it's something that you can very well exploit to reduce the problem of, um, of control. And the other elements that you can exploit, it's not intrinsic into the muscle itself, but it's extrinsic, uh, meaning that you can exploit the constitution of the collagen, so of the matrix where the arm is embedded in. Why? Because both vertebrate and octopus cephalopods muscles are full of uh, what you see here, elastic, this is called collagenous elastic uh, uh, fibers. But these fibers are indeed very relevant for hydrostatic muscles. And this is because by changing a lot the length, if you just think about how a spring is moving, the more you compress or you elongate a, um, an, elastic, uh, an elastic structure, the more force you can release. So of course, by playing with length and with passive elastic forces, you can reduce a lot the complexity of control. So by studying these two uh, elements in the main, uh, in the two main muscle, uh, muscle later of the arm bulk, we indeed found that the architecture of this, this that we call super coiled elastic fiber is dramatically different in various type of the octopus arm. So that means that evolutionary, also the octopus uses 
this strategy to reduce the complexity of controlling the motion and even to save energy because he can indeed um, uh, he can store a lot of elastic energy during motions. Okay, so we believe that this architecture is very important and it's at the basis of two of many motion that the octopus can do. And in particular, the, the, the two muscles that makes the arm valve are used differently. Although they are perfect, perfectly similar in terms of physiology, only the embedding in the collagen matrix make them very different. So you can exploit this in soft uh, robotics. And here you can see a few of the prototypes that we build uh, during the Octopus project. You can see the, how this can be either completely flexible or let's say based on a small, very small, uh, very small, very small uh, structure. And uh, you can uh, very well exploit these, uh, uh, these soft limbs in order to allow them to work in non-homogeneous and discontinuous structures, which are typical of, for example, the human body cavity for which this uh, soft, uh, soft limb are uh, mostly created, soft articulate, soft uh, robotic limb. And here you can see an example of what only one arm in the, uh, it was built in the Octopus project can do and how it can, um, and how it can interact with the hand, okay? So imagine that this interaction is partially uh, passive, so it's only due to the material construction of, of this arm, because this arm does not have any uh, mechanosensor uh, embedded in, the, in its surface. Okay, so last but not least, what you can, uh, what we can, do in the next project now will be to implement exactly what it's lacking so far in soft robots, which is very sophisticated uh, mechanism of controlling uh, chemicals and uh, mechanical uh, response of the arm. So mechanical stimulation of the arm. And this is only one of the examples. This is a very simple example of how you can build, uh, build artificial uh, suckers. And uh, here I want to show you one of the uh, uh, one very interesting uh, interesting mechanism that have been uh, developed in, in uh, one of our study. This mechanism of uh, this is a, a mechanism based on mechano sensation. And this is basically uh, based on the uh, presence of uh, uh, light of optical fibers within these completely soft structures. So based on the uh, mechanical stimulation of this optic fiber, the optic fiber will release a signal that will be fed back to the controller. And the controller is able through this integration to calculate the position of the touch, either if it's single or if it's multiple. So now next step will be to close this, this, uh, this circle and to integrate also uh, a response of the uh, artificial uh, artificial structure. So I hope I'll convince you that the octopus arm does represent an extraordinary example of uh, adaptable morphology, and you can very well exploit its characteristics in terms of control and in terms of material construction to build rather autonomous soft uh, robots. And with this, I conclude. And as we are approaching uh, uh, Christmas and also Hanukkah, I wish you all uh, a very nice celebration and thank you for your attention. Thank you a lot. It was fascinating. Uh, things that uh, you cannot see so often. So I will now open to the um, to the question and answer session. Um, as I said before, you can uh, write your question in the chat or raise your digital hand. And uh, we have already, I think, one question from uh, Milton. Please show us how you uh, trigger activity and record the specific areas 
cells responses uh, responses in the living octopus. Okay, uh, so the the recording were done with uh, uh, with stainless steel uh, wire, so they were not uh, telemetric uh, telemetric responses. So the octopus was freely moving uh, in the tank, but he was still connected with wires on top of his uh, of his head. And uh, if you I don't know if you know a bit about the morphology of the octopus uh, head and skull. So the advantage that we had uh, is that the octopus has a, a very tiny cartilaginous structure that it's enveloping the central brain. So we were opening this cartilaginous structure and we were able to insert a, a base with the erector tip between this structure and the surface of the brain. So the surface that was, of course, was, uh, uh, was, by, was passed from the, uh, from the electrode. So this allowed to maintain a rather constant, uh, constant recording. And even if the octopus was trying to pull it, the, the wire away, it was still a very, uh, very stable. OK, thank you. Um... So please, uh, we have a few more minutes to go. So if you have any other question, this is the time. In the meanwhile, I would ask you, how did you get to study the octopus? Like from how come that uh, this was the field of your studying? I start, okay, I start as, I see Benny is still muted. So in my case, uh, it was uh, as many things in life, maybe it was by chance and by, by let's say choice, both together. So I started my master degree at the Stationary Zoologica in Naples, where you can work on uh, many, many animal species. But I was uh, mainly interested at that time in uh, uh, neurobiology and behavior. And so I started my master on uh, squids, on the chromatophore system of squids. And uh, there, I actually, I had the chance of uh, meeting Benny. And then we started this project of brain recordings uh, together. OK. Thank you. So I don't see any other questions. Oh, so just, uh, uh, just I want to to add something about how I started studying octopus. For me, it was a big change. Uh, actually, I came to Naples to learn how to to do experiment with octopuses. But we we are actually heard about um, a project from the American Navy which is aimed to uh, really learn from the octopus how to, how to build a uh, flexible submarine uh, uh, robot. So it was, it was inspired by a grant from the Navy and the, the idea is that nature is the best uh, engineer uh, evolution. Yeah, especially the octopus, I, we learned today. Okay, so again, I don't see any other question. So I would thank you a lot for your time and uh, your very interesting lecture. Um, to, to our public, uh, we have more webinars in the future next week. Uh, uh, we will have uh, another one. You will receive soon in the next days uh, the recording of this webinar with the invitation for the next one. And uh, if you have any other question, you can write to my mail and I will forward uh, to Benny or to Letizia. So thank you, everybody. And uh, thank you for the interesting knowledge that you gave us. Thanks to you for the invitation. And uh, happy Christmas and happy Hanukkah that Thank it's you. coming to both of them. Thank you. Thank you.